Hello everybody, this is James Abo on the Scoverden, dedicated to original peoples, and we've got a special guest in, he's been on before, I'm bringing him back for part two, Mr. Robin Walker, how are you doing my brother, how are you, you okay? Very, very well sir, very, very well. Well, thank you very much, a uh, great historian, and covering um, 90,000 years of African history, when we ruled, what an um, amazing masterpiece, and the whole idea of basically going really care being a very careful researcher as well and picking up with our greats left off also like the chancellor williams and many more so just um give us a little introduction to the, the book when we ruled the book when we ruled i wrote it in 2006 and the point of the book was to put together the most powerful information on ancient and medieval black history in one source where you can essentially have a one-stop shop to learn ancient and medieval African heritage. The story does go up to the 20th century. The story goes up to about 1957. So you get a good insight into what Africans were doing and the idea was to build on the work of the elder scholars, but to uh, build on their strengths, learn from their weaknesses, correct their errors, and put my own spin and flavor in expressing myself about what I think about our history and heritage. Very interesting. And you did an amazing job. Uh, I, I call it a masterpiece. And, um... It, a whole, I like the whole idea of like you're recognizing the weaknesses, you're recognizing the strengths, and also what you can add to it yourself, your own flavor, which at the end of the day, that's what it's about, isn't it? And um, so when we're going back, say when we're dealing with the oldest time, well, we're dealing with 90,000 years. I don't hear too many historians speaking about 90,000 years. When I say 90,000 years, they'll speak on it as in like, you know, certain thing diets they were eating and the I, i'm talking about like civilizations what we call civilizations and I, I was i was looking at also when um you were talking about the first knowledge of how to fish as well that was interested as well because there is civilization i mean it's not just about huge buildings civilization you know it's much more you know that's the later stages anyway so if we go back to like 90,000 years ago, uh, are we dealing with a time that some scholars say we left Africa and populated the world? Some say 90,000, some say 80. You, you're sure you've heard all the different dates conflicting. So around this time, 90,000 years, is what are you actually, how, how was you able to go to this 90,000 years and do it so well as well? All right, let me explain that. Civilization, as we have it today, goes back 8,000 years. Before we have civilization, we have prehistory, but human beings were still doing things in prehistory. The difference is human beings, as far as we know, didn't have governments, as far as we know, didn't have a legal system in place, as far as we know, didn't have government boundaries, and so the things that governments do today, the first place to have that going on was 8,000 years ago. And that was ancient Nubia, a kingdom called the Kingdom of Tarseti. Before that period, we're dealing with prehistory. But it doesn't mean humans were idle. It just means that there are very specific things that we can point to. So 90,000 years ago in northeastern Congo, we know that humans were engaged in what is known to be the first known human culture. It's not a civilization. They haven't got writing yet. They haven't got governments yet. But what um, the archaeologists found were a series of harpoon points, all elaborately polished and barbed. And these harpoon points suggested that the Africans 90,000 years ago in northeastern Congo were engaged in an early fishing-based culture and it is thought that the fish that they were are, are trying to catch were catfish. And because catfish are a seasonal fish, it means essentially that those early humans 90,000 years ago were involved in strategic planning for subsistence. 
and the tools to do it, these elaborately polished and barbed uh, harpoon points becomes the beginnings of tool technology, the way that we have it today. And those same fish um, hook points, these harpoon points, you see very similar ones going further north into the Nile Valley, going into Egypt and those kind of places. You see similar things going into West Africa, and it might show the spread of a technology starting in Central Africa and spreading north and spreading west. And that's now quite an interesting thing because it shows that technological innovation starting in one place then spreads to other places. Now, going from 90,000 years ago to 8,000 BC, excuse me, 6,000 BC, 8,000 years ago, we can point to a, a series of steps that early Africans were engaged in, where we're seeing more and more and more technological sophistication before we get full blown civilization. Okay, yeah. So interesting, um, especially to go from 90,000 to 6,000. But it's, it, I love your logic where you're explaining about um, the date that we're given. It's, it's almost like people were not really doing anything. They didn't have, they weren't able to, they didn't have the brain capacity to be able to do such great things. So I like the way you've covered that. And even like the, the fishing, I mean, how can, fishing's just so important and it, it's always been important, especially in Africa, around the, all the rivers that we've got, you know, where, and that's part of, it's always been part of our diet for a long time, you know, and um, now when it comes to um, language now, I mean, I've looked at the Mandi, I've looked at the Niger Congo, then the Bantu, which are all connected in some sort of way. Now, with the Bantu, because you have Eastern Bantu, which they spread, you got, you know, they come into southern well, parts of Namibia and areas like that. Now, it's with the Bantu, we discussed this last time, and um, the connection that we made, we didn't make a connection from. We were speaking about Nigeria, and I was trying to make the connection with uh, the Yoruba, speaking on, coming from Kemet. So did the Dogon. Um, now, you connected the Hausa, and you connected the Fulani. Now, with the Bantu... Not the Fulani. Not the Fulani. No, oh, not the Fulani. No. Hausa, definitely. Hausa. Yeah. Um, Kushitic, which is Somali, definitely. Uh, not Fulani, no. Okay. So where the Fulani from? Are they from... Um, they Adam? are thought to have come from further west in Africa than they are okay. now. Right, yeah, okay. But... Mm -hmm. Yeah. So anyway, uh, the Bantu connection now, yeah. If do you find any Bantu connection in ancient Kemet? Not as far as I know. Not as far as I know. That doesn't mean that I'm right. Uh, there is a scholar from, um, I think he's either from Kenya or Tanzania. Um, his name will come back to me in a minute. But he's a, a linguist and he believes that you can use Bantu languages to sound out ancient Egyptian words. Well, right. interesting, interesting. This is, I've heard the same, same as myself. I also did read something about, it was Uganda area where there was relating linguistic ties to Uganda or it was either, <laughs> no, actually a DNA. It was actually a DNA. Ramsey's the third. So now Ramsey's is much later yeah, yeah. This yeah. is so. I was more interested in the connection before very early, the earliest dynasties, trying to mm -hmm. make these connections. Yeah. Um, and then just well, remember so, the guy's name. He, he goes by the name of Ferg S. F E R G S. Ferg S. Okay. Yeah. Have you ever um, come across Clyde mm -hmm. Winters? Have you ever? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Now, what the how how. Because he comes with a lot of solid stuff. And yeah. I love, I try to always like be, I don't like to just be a biased person. Yes, I just want to agree with everything. And I'm trying to look now. And he speaks on um, the area there, I don't know what you'd call it, Chad, when the Sahara Desert was no desert. Yeah, and he, yeah. he says like 3,500 BC when the desert started um, 
they spread this a population called the C group. He said they spread mm-hmm. into Kemet, they spread into Nubia, possibly mm-hmm. also that area, and also went into become the Sumerians and into ancient India, the Indus Valley, and then Persia, the Elamites as well. Mm-hmm. Now, do you recognize this connection yourself? No. No. Um, okay. No. Now, let's be clear. Those ancient civilizations were all peopled by black people. Yeah. Um, and we can all, we can claim all of them. And there is a connection between the ancient Saharan culture that Clyde Ahmad Winters is talking about yes. and ancient Egypt. We can definitely connect it. There may be a connection between it and Sumerian. Yeah. The problem is, is with Clyde Ahmad Winters, his archaeology is usually solid, but his linguistics is nowhere near as tight as it needs to be. There's a mm-hmm. there's a saying that I teach my students: extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. Yeah. So when uh, Dr. Winters cites archaeological sources you check out those sources what he said is in those sources is there yeah when it comes to the linguistics though it is nowhere near as tight as it needs to be so if you were to present some of clyde Ahmad winters's uh linguistics you would have people taking pot shots at you and you might not be able to defend what um he is suggesting to be the case you see yeah definitely now the saharan uh culture that he's talking about i'm fully aware of that culture and i've got it in my book um uh, when we ruled it's the same culture that produced um the juan muhujiaj mummy that same culture in you libya know, juan yeah the libyan black child yeah uh, yeah they call it the that. black mummy mystery yeah uh, i don't use the term black mummy because all libyans during that time period would have been black so Funky. that child yeah. is no spe- <laughs> no, no no special so the culture he's talking about um the archaeologists support what he's saying the okay. only issue that i'm raising questions about is does the linguistics stand up to the standards of you know where you know people are going to come out and criticize you yeah can you make the data stand up so that people can't take pot shots at you yes yeah. that's right definitely i mean some of the stuff because i've never like actually seen a researcher who's um qualified in in them areas and come out with like big claims very big ones you know what I mean some of the stuff like I don't write it enough enough I mean at the end of the day the linguistic ties now mm-hmm. even yourself there's certain things that seem to attach the Bantu a lot I seem to see popping up so when we say Niger Congo that's linking with the Bantu isn't it then yeah. now the Mandi this is the linguistic tie that Clyde Winters is saying that they spoke um, the Mandi, the ones mm-hmm. that, and then Sumerians and uh, the Indus Valley civilization times and the people mm-hmm. there. So, mm-hmm. did you have you noticed anything linguistically on African linguistics in in Asia? Um, the, the one scholar whose work um, I would I would you know if I'm going to stand on my square, yeah, I stand on his square. Okay. Um, there is a series of books produced by Pomegranate Publishing. And there are some books with titles like Black Suma, uh, Black Suma, The Physical Evidence. Do you see? Yeah. And one of those books has got the linguistic connections that connect Sumerian to Proto-Bantu. Now, this isn't claiming that the Sumerians spoke uh, Proto-Bantu. What you've got is one line of scholarship is Proto-Bantu. Sumerian is another. And if they're sharing a common ancestor, the common 
common ancestor would be Niger Congo. Yeah. Makes sense. People were now, into England. Yeah. Yeah. Now mm -hmm. that would stand up in court. So what would happen is, is, and we know this because some of the data was presented many, many years ago on a website called Ancient Near East. A-N-E, Ancient Near East. And what would happen is, is linguists would, would strut their stuff. So someone would post, other people would say, no, you're chatting rubbish, and then hit back. Somebody else would post. Uh, other people would come back and say, no, that's rubbish, hit back. When the Sumerian proto Bantu connections were presented, nobody was in a position to hit back. Do you see? Yeah. And it was in a gladiatorial type of environment, you know, where you've got the people ready to hit down what you've got. And even when people did hit it down, um, you know, people were able to come back and defend. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. That's, so it's a stronger and that's the argument. Research. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's the research that ended up in the books of Black Suma. Okay. Interesting. So yeah. it, at least it, it does have a leg to stand on. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, whereas the Mande stuff, uh, that was also presented on the same site, Ancient Near East. Yeah. And... Yeah. You know, I hate to say it, but my man took some licks that he couldn't come back from, oh. you see. Yeah. Well, yeah. when you dig too deep, make sure you know your roots and your path. <laughs> and, and make sure that you know that you've got the stuff tight enough that it will stand up against people coming to, you know, you know, snipers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, coming to, yeah. to shoot down what you've got. You've got to be able to survive the sniper fire. Definitely, definitely. Um, yeah, I mean, you see what 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 it, what makes things a little bit more difficult sometimes, because when we're going back at the times of Diop and the amount of racism he was up against, he was challenging so much. So sometimes it can make us paranoid to think to the. Are, is this presented with a fair argument, or is it basically white supremacy? Eurocentric. And, 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 a lot, and a lot of it is both. Yeah. But you still have to be able to hold your head up yeah. against sniper fire. Definitely. So to give you an example of what I mean, um, right now people are making noise about whether or not Cleopatra was black and what impact does this have on ancient Egyptian history. There are, there are going to be snipers out there, but certainly I could stand up to any of those snipers and I could yeah. knock back any of the arguments they want to come with. doesn't matter what you come with. And yeah. even if people are coming with their alt-right handbooks, I can still smack them back. Do you see? Yeah. yeah? You, it's got to be like that when you're going into these intellectual arenas. Definitely. So Cleopatra... You, you know, we some you see sometimes she was white, a Greek, or she she was African. You know, yeah. what what do you make of her? Do you make her as a, as an African or a Greek mix, Greek African or anything? This is what the problem is. I can tell. You, this is what the problem is. There's a display at the British Museum right now of some of the um, Ptolemaic pharaohs. And some of them definitely have African faces. No doubt about it. Some of them definitely have European faces. Now, this is what the complicating factor is. The complicating factors are the artwork aimed at people in Egypt makes them look more African. And the ones aimed at people in Europe looks European. Okay, And that's the same with Cleopatra. If you look at the portraits that are in Egyptian style, she looks like a regular Egyptian woman. If you look at the ones where she's on coins aimed at European audiences, she looks European. Yeah. Right. So some scholars have therefore taken the position, well, let's split the difference. Let's take the coins. Let's take the portraits and merge them. And there is a scholar... Dr. Sally Ann Ashton, and she's merged them, and she's gone public to say she was a dual heritage. Yeah. 
Now, the dual heritage theory is a theory that I can flow with. And my theory is this. Um, what's been left out of the discussion is the remains of a grand woman who may well be Cleopatra's sister called Arsinoe has been found. And a TV documentary was made about it in Britain. And the, the remains that may well be Arsinoe show a mixture of African and European traits. Right. Yeah, because the, and, the Greeks were mixing at, at the time, weren't they, with the Egyptians? Yeah, so in the case of Cleopatra, you have uh, a whole bunch of Ptolemies uh, from one, my research says, up to 13, some say 14. And then Cleopatra's from one to seven, and she's number seven. And it is believed that the Ptolemies took Egyptian wives, and those Egyptian wives would have been African wives. Yeah. And that's why you would get um, some of the art looking African, some of it being U European. But as I said, it also depends on which audience it was aimed at. So the portraits of Cleopatra in Egyptian style look like a black woman. Okay. Yes. Yeah. The coins um, th that that that's that, that circulated in the Greek world. She looks like a white woman. Yeah. Okay. So we do have that problem. Okay, so you can split the difference, which is what Sally Ann Ashton has done. And then we've got the possible um, sister, Arsinoe, having African and European traits. So the sensible position, um, Shakespeare was ahead of us. Shakespeare calls her Tawny. Tawny. And Tawny is a complexion in between African and European. Right. So it yeah. appears that, yeah. Yeah, that, that um, um, uh, uh, Shakespeare was on the money. It, it appears that he was on the money. And the actress that's causing the stink is of Afro-European stock, as far as I know. Okay, yeah. So in other words, I would argue that what they presented is would stand up in court. Okay, yeah. So that's what it is. It's about making sure you're prepared to go in. To, Absolutely, and make yeah. sure that you've got you, you've got your your T's crossed and yeah. your I's dotted. Definitely, definitely, don't miss a trick. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. So back to where, where we were saying now. Where, where, what what's your take on um, spirituality? Also, um, you know, African African spirit, and there's many different spiritual systems and that. But just from we've had so much negativity from Europeans. When they consider things as like they were into voodoo, which is, and from their perspective, everyone everything had to be negative. There was nothing positive about healing or nothing like that. So I mean, and I I get when I have to ask different people these kind of questions. By the way, because if a person's religious, they will give me a totally different answer. So this is why I'm interested to see your views on African spirituality. Yeah, these are my views. Um. I was educated by the great Dr. Femi Biko. So a lot of my ideas come from him. Yeah. Now, I classify myself as a Christian. Most okay. Christians classify me as a heathen, but I don't care, frankly. Yeah? Yeah. Now, my thing is this. African spirituality um, can be, and certainly was in ancient Egypt and ancient Sudan, brilliant. Yeah. yeah, it produced a brilliant civilization. Um, spirituality, religion, whatever you want to call it, in Benin, in Yoruba land, produced yeah. same thing, brilliance. And I'm not hating on it. Now, most intellectuals, I'm not saying I'm one of them, but hell, most people that are of a scholarly bent, let's call it that, are usually anti-religious. Yeah. I'm not. I'm pro-religion. Because I think religion is a good thing. I think yeah. it's a, a good thing that's helped humanity and helps people on an individual basis. So I'm very pro it. And as Dr. Biko teaches, religion is made up of four elements. The four elements are: you've got the um, uh, the, the, the 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 creation story, and then with the creation story becomes one part of it. You then have another part of it, which is the, the, the rule book, the ethics. Then you've got another part of it, which is the spirituality. 
And then you've got another part of it, which is the, the oracles, do you see? Yeah. Yeah. And so when people say, I'm not religious, I'm spiritual, what they're really doing is running with a quarter of what a religion is. Yeah. Do you see? Yeah. Now, I don't believe our ancestors ran with a quarter. They ran with the whole thing. They, 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 they had their ethics. They had their cosmology. They had their rituals. They had their oracles. And, and if you look at what we were able to build with those things, we built a lot of good stuff. So it's like everything was included and it was needed to be included to be this all-inclusive. And, and then yeah. the, the other thing too is a lot of people have this idea that if you believe in religion or spirituality, that means you're non-scientific or anti-scientific. But if you look at the belief systems of some of the African ancestors, such as the, the Dogon of the Bandiagara Cliffs, um, some of what they're coming with resembles Big Bang. Some of what they're coming with resembles string theory. Some of what they're coming with resembles particle theory. Some of what they're coming with, you've got things that are similar to fundamental particles, things that are similar to spin particles and the four different types of properties that spin particles have. So there is nothing scientifically illiterate about what they're coming with. Yeah, yeah. Totally yeah. understand. Yeah. Yet, yet it's a religion, it's a spirituality. Do you see? Now, yeah. interesting, um, you're connecting to religion, even though um, <clears throat> you still study history, and, but at the same time. The, I, I've written two books on religion, so I. I, I yeah. I, I, well, I, I, where, I, I was gonna go, where I was going to go with this, because I always ask yeah. a few different people this question whether creationists, well, creationists, obviously, we know what they're going to say, but science. The common ancestor with apes. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. do you take how serious do you take this, or do you take it very serious? And it was ask different people this because I answer the question this mm. way. Frankly, I don't know. I don't know, but I do know that if the bones exist, you've got data. Okay. So if okay. we're looking at humans exactly as we are today, the bones that show the humans exactly as we are today. The oldest ones go back uh, about 195,000 years, and they were found in yeah. Ethiopia, in Omo. Yeah. Then you've got bones that are a bit older, uh, going back before that, that still have human-type faces. I don't know if you've seen the reconstruction of, a, of the skeleton. What do you call it? Hood, Is it what? The, the one that looks just like 50 Cent. Okay, right, right. Um, Why don't you have you on about Lucy... Skegness. Oh no, no, we're, we're coming, we're coming, we're coming. Okay, we're okay, coming. okay. Yeah. And then and um and then before that, you've got uh skeletons and bones and things of uh, Homo erectus, and then before that we've got Homo habilis, and then before that we've got the Australopithecines, such as Australopithecus robustus. And in every case, the bones exist. In the case of Lucy or Dinkenesh. By the way, I've seen the bones of Lucy or Dinkanesh. I was in Ethiopia um, last month, and it's in the National Museum. And you see the actual bones, then you see the bones reconstructed, and then you see the, the, the skin put on it and so on. Yeah? Okay, okay. So let's be clear. Lucy, Dinkanesh, Australopithecus afarensis exists. Now, should we call Australopithecus afarensis our common parent? Don't know. But the okay. main point is, is that okay. it's in Africa and yeah. that shuts down any non-African argument. That's the way I play it. Do you see? Yeah, yeah. I totally that understand. Way, I'm, not, I'm yeah. not raising the question of did yeah. A evolve into B? Did B evolve into C? I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. But the main point is it's in Africa and it shuts down any non-African argument. That's the way I play it. So... You, I'd say you're quite neutral on the argument of you're recognizing that they are definitely, there's evidence there that they've been found in Africa. There's the evidence. Absolutely. Absolutely. But at the same time, whether or not they are our ancestors or we are separated, you're neutral on it. Absolutely neutral. And I think everyone who's scholarly has to be neutral because it's not. Uh, some take it's it really possible. serious, though. <laughs> no, no, no. Here's the point it's possible, but okay. that's not the same as proof. Yeah, yeah. I mean, does it connect? 
haven't heard anything like oral history connected yeah. to anything like that. Doesn't mean it's not possible. That's but, right. Um, that's right. I connect with like creationism to a degree, and I connect with but but, but science creationism. To a degree. But creationism, you've got to remember what creationism is. Um, the the books of Genesis, yeah, you know, there's two versions of creation. There's one in Genesis chapter one and the contradictory one in Genesis chapter two. Okay, contradictory. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the, if, you, if you read the two accounts and, and write them down step by step by step, the order is different in Genesis chapter two compared to Genesis chapter one. Now, right. why are they different? What people don't understand is a lot of that stuff is poetry. It's not science. It's poetry. Okay. Now, it may have a spiritual value, but that's not the same as science, you see. Yeah, yeah. So the idea, well, if evolution is wrong, the Bible is right. I'm not coming with that. Yeah? The Bible is poetry. Yeah. <laughs> Do you see? Yeah. You make the connections with ancient Kemet, Kemet obviously, and... Um... Christianity and all the rest of all the all the religions. The um, this is what I teach people. Abraham I teach people. in particular. Yeah, if you look at the history of religions, and it doesn't matter which one. Yeah, we black folks are in the story, and rather than my religion is better than yours, no, 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 my religion is better. Than yours. Rather than play that game, recognize all those great black men and women theologians, people that came up with religious and spiritual ideas, thought leaders, influencers, um, people now call them prophets. Um, I don't care which religion people come with. Yeah. Yeah. The main yeah. point is that history, some of that history is ours. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And that's that's the way I look at it. So I'm proud of all of it. We you have see, a you know, some people got this idea that if it's yeah. Abrahamic, then it's alien. I don't take yeah. that view. Okay, okay, yeah. That's it. You got to look at the similarities, isn't it? You know what's and, and also from the one fact place. that black people are in there. So if we're talking about Christianity, yeah, you can't get past Saint Augustine. Yeah, you can't get past him. If we're talking about um, uh, Judaism, um, that allegedly goes back to the prophet Moses, and if he existed, he was African. Do you see? Yes, that's yeah. it. If you're going to talk about Islam, you're going to have to bring up the the Mu'athin in Islam, a uh, Bilal. Yeah, you can't get past him. If you want to talk about Sufism, you're going to have to bring up Zu Ul Nun, who was born on quote the Egypto Nubian border. Did you know that? Yeah. See. So, okay. so in other words, we can't get past him. You, you, you see, you can't write these people out of the history and then pretend to have a religion. It can't be done. Yeah. Totally, but, what, totally. what, 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 but what many of us do is we think, oh, well, if it's Abrahamic, we're throwing it out. No, you're in the story. <laughs> you know, your no. people help create the thing. Yeah, well, that makes more sense anyway. It's not. It's not a case of Kermit versus religion. It's just a case of within the story, we shared knowledge and we shared civilization in the beginning. Anyway, you know, we were the first to migrate, so you know, um, I'm happy with that anyway. So. But, um, <clears throat> yeah, it's, I mean, it's, it's funny sometimes. I mean, I'm sure yourself, like, um, you've probably been in situations where you've had to produce you, your evidence, your works. Have, you know, have you been in them positions yourself where you've had oh, to... Oh, indeed, indeed. indeed. Yeah. But, but what, I, what I've done, what I do now is learning from my, 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 my colleagues and brothers, yeah? Yeah. If you're, you, you, you're doing a presentation, you cut, you walk with your computer. I've got my lectures already laid out. I've got my evidence already ready. So it doesn't matter where people want to bring the argument. Um, I'll just pull up my notes. Let's talk. <laughs> Do you see? Yeah, that's it. So, and, and my thing is this. Once you know how history is written, and this is how it's written, you write it in the same way as a lawyer presenting a case. That's how okay. history is written, right? Yeah. So you, everything you say has to be grounded in the evidence. Now, you don't have to agree with the evidence. You can disagree with it, but it still has to be grounded in the evidence. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right, let me give you an example. In 1964, a hematite mine was found in Swaziland or Eswatini. 
and that mine was found to be 43,200 years old. Wow. Now, if we take the data at face value, that's what the data says. Yeah. But if you say, but I don't agree with that because I think Professor Raymond Dart, who did it, was a liar, and I can prove he was a liar, we're still debating the evidence. Do you see? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah? We're still debating the evidence. The difference is, is I accept what he says he said, and you disagree. You think he was a liar, and this is why he's a liar, and you present your case. But we're still talking about the evidence. That's yeah? it. You can't get off the evidence. That's what it is. Right. Yeah. And, that, and that's the way you, you write you write history. So you don't have to agree with the evidence, but you have to acknowledge that that's what it is. Definitely. Definitely. If someone wrote a book and said nothing was discovered in Johan, uh, nothing was discovered in Eswatini or Swat Swaziland, now you're lying. Yeah. You see, yeah. you can say that the evidence was found, but you don't agree with it because of X, Y, Z, but you that's can't right. say nothing was found. Do you see? Yeah. So so with uh, Christianity, uh, funny enough, uh, you know, um, you have the Orthodox and then <laughs> you have yeah. West, what they call Western Christianity, if you want to call it that. Um, the Council of Nicaea, 325 mm -hmm. AD. Mm -hmm. um, was this the time when um, the whole change of Christianity in 325 Possibly. AD? Possibly. Possibly. Yeah. Here's the problem. I gather that there were 14 volumes of proceedings and seven volumes of mi minutes yeah. uh, that were taken at the Council of Nicaea. Uh, Professor Yusef ben Yochanan talks about this. But what I haven't seen, and what I haven't seen anywhere, is has anyone actually got them, and has anyone actually published them? Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. What happens is a lot of us are speculating on what was said at that conference. So one speculation is the Bible was canonized, you know, put together the way we have it today. Yeah. Now, I believe that personally, but yeah. I'm prepared to say that speculation because until I actually know what was in the 14 volumes of proceedings and the seven volumes of minutes, I can't say for, 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 for a fact what was said. And your the thing that this is where things changed, you're probably right. But again, we're in the realm of the speculation because, as I said, what was actually said at the, 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 that conference, I think the scholars have done a very good job of sitting on that data. Yeah, yeah. I mean, sometimes it, it, it's uh, there's a lot of grey areas, I'm sure you, you come across. And, um, indeed, indeed. But um, well, like there's so there's so many people who deal jump on this stone. That that that's what I mean. There's a lot of people use this argument. Yeah, so common, so common like this argument. That's why I actually was interested in your opinion on it. Have you found any evidence of this? What was said in the Council of Nicaea? You know, that's why um, I was asking. Many years ago, when I read about it in Professor Yusef ben Yochanan's book, that's why I joined the British Library. And I did come across a book that might have had that content, but the book was in Latin. So uh, we'll, we'll come when, the book was when it was delivered to me, it was like, I can't read any of this. Well, well, coming there to the end now anyway. So, you know, okay. I want to thank you very much, Robin Walker. This is James DeBow on Discovered and Dedicate to Original Peoples. And I really appreciate you. And maybe sometime we can do this again when you're free. No problem at all. And it's been a pleasure.